everybody, this is Britt Lightning of Vixen, and you're listening to the Ken Valdez Approach on Rock Rage Radio. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Ken Valdez Approach. <laughs> Well, oh, yeah. Welcome on in, everybody. Hope y'all are well. It's your boy KV coming at you from my Soul Renegade Sound Studios right here in Minneapolis. I am welcoming you to the Ken Valdez Approach. Now, I'm going to admit something to y'all. I'm a little late to the game on this one. Sadly, I don't think I'm alone. But let me tell you about this. Recently, I discovered this movie that blew my mind, grabbed my soul, it hasn't let go, I can't stop thinking about it, I can't stop talking about it, I want to see it again and again. This movie, this documentary, is called Rumble, The Indians Who Rocked the World. It is incredible. I find this to be mandatory viewing for everybody. Whether you're into music or not, whether you're into rock and roll or not, this is just one of those movies that I believe everybody should see because it's so educational and it's something that that I really believe we should know so much more about. This film was created by a legendary guitar player by the name of Stevie Salas. Now, Stevie has played with everybody from Mick Jagger to Rod Stewart to my hero, Jeff Healy, my other hero, Billy Gibbons. Man, the list is endless. He's also a best-selling author. The guy is a philanthropist, you know, and again, just a raging guitar player. Man, we have so many parallels, and we're just going to get right on into this conversation. You're going to see how this conversation picks up, right? We've been talking, and uh, we just decided, hey, we got to hit record. Check this out. My interview with Stevie Salas right here on The Approach. So, hey, I am with Stevie Salas right now, and we're just chit-chatting. We're, we're just going to town, and we were talking about our buddy Marco Nunez and the legendary Randy Castillo. We're just we're just chit chatting, man. We're having a good time today. So yeah, well, continue, me, my friend. Hey, real quick. So Randy Castillo. Um, let's get to the point where, where Randy passed away. And, right. And and for a long time, his parents in Albuquerque took all his stuff and they they moved it into this one room in the house, and they closed the doors, and they never opened it. Right. Oh wow. So. Forward to a bunch of years later, I'm creating an exhibit for the Smithsonian National Museum of the American Indian. Um, the second exhibit, we did a small exhibit in New York City. I'm sorry, in Washington, D.C. And um, originally, the Smithsonian being a highbrow establishment, they were all about Buffy St. Marie and Robbie Robertson and these people right. with the exhibit and, and historic people um, and Charlie Patton. But, but they didn't. Re- they didn't really want Randy Castillo. And <laughs> you guys are crazy. I go. I'm not going to do it without Randy Castillo. Yeah, man. Because they go the drummer of Ozzy Osbourne. You know, that's a, an intellectual. And I go. You don't get it. First of all, Tim. Tim uh, the Mohawk uh, man who brought me to the Smithsonian, who was the co co director, Tim Johnson. One of the objectives when they brought me to to, to work at this museum was to get younger people to come to the museum, get younger people in the door, make it more relevant to younger indigenous people and younger people in general. So I said to them, I go, if you take Randy Castillo out of this exhibit, I go, you're losing a massive amount of uh, the audience. And I go, it's not gonna work. So they finally like, blah, blah, blah. And they agreed to let me do it. And I bet you now, if you ask them, they all say that's bullshit, but it's totally true. They didn't want Randy and they thought Ozzy Osbourne was like uneducated, you know, and un- un- like a not intelligent, not Smithsonian material. Right. So we get Randy into the exhibit. The first exhibit opens in Washington, D.C. And um, I start getting phone calls from the office. Stevie, because I didn't live in D.C. I'd fly in and out to w- and work, and I was living in my, my beach house in Carlsbad, California. And uh, they go, Stevie, there's a group of kids here in leather jackets that have been <laughs> out all day, and they're just hanging around the exhibit and hanging around Randy's uh, uh, piece. And... And I go, I told you, he started, he got a ton of people that come into that museum that would never come in that museum. Yeah. So then we fast forward that exhibit in Washington, D.C. was only supposed to be a three month exhibit. And it was a small exhibit just to show some indigenous people who had done some amazing things. 
Um, all of a sudden we realized it's the biggest exhibit, most popular exhibit they've ever had at the museum, as far as popular uh. goes. And they extend it to as long as they can, which was six months because they already had a new exhibit coming into that room. So then they say to me, let's move it to the Smithsonian in New York. And they go, um, we're going to make it four times bigger. So in comes Marco Nunez. Ah. <laughs> well, well, meanwhile, let me just tell you. So while I was first getting the first exhibit together in D.C., I had to call Randy's uh, sister's mom and go to the mom's house. And you want to talk about a heavy afternoon. They open that door. And I had the job of going through everything that was in there. I mean, I had to go through cases of papers and photographs and albums and and all his personal stuff and pho oh, photographs of him and Warhol and all this stuff, you know, his historic stuff, videos, uh, his drum set. He had a drum set or two in there. Everything was just in there, clothes, jackets. And it was so heavy and, and it was such a hard weekend because his mom would just break down and sit out and start crying oh man telling me about randy should have never got this tattoo he got right after he did his hair <laughs> and all this stuff you know because that made his immune system weaker so i had to be there and really it was a heavy heavy thing to have to be there with with randy's mom as i went through all that material and the sisters everybody showed up it was a big deal and you know it was a lot of tears and a lot of uh a lot of sadness. And so then the exhibit comes out, it becomes the most popular exhibit at the Washington, at the National Museum of the American Indian. And they said, let's move to New York, let's make it four times bigger. So I come back in, I start redesigning with the people at Smithsonian, the new exhibit. And we decide we're gonna get a drum set, Randy Castillo's drum set. And we're gonna put it on plexiglass and hang it. And I think to myself, God, Randy Castillo would just die if he knew his drum set was in the Smithsonian. Right. You know? But Marco Nunez, I flew to New Mexico and he had pulled out the case, he'd cleaned it all up, he had um, made, tuned it, got the symbols clean, and he made it beautiful for Randy and set it up really nice. And he was such a big help um, because he really got that kit. He knew exactly how Randy set up his kit and the, the way it was. And so it was, it was amazing. And that was an amazing experience. And, and later on when Rumble came out, when I was watching Randy in the film, I just kept thinking, God, Randy would freak out, man, if he knew he was in this film and yeah. and, and being, tr you know, looked at that way. But it's uh, it was pretty cool. Pretty God, cool. man, that's amazing to hear. And I mean, he was such a, just an icon uh, of, of that time in that scene. And everybody talks about, you know, just the brilliance, you know, of, 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 metal drumming if you will right and his name comes up repeatedly but i mean you know knowing that he is also just i mean just a world-class player right that's just that's just who he was and man what a what a crazy loss and i mean you know i was i was really young when when i met randy like i mean i'm talking like 14 years old mm -hmm. right and he was he was just the nicest guy he was just yeah. so cool, so down to earth, and 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 very motivating, right? It's like, hey man, you know, if if rock and roll is going to stay alive, we got to get them while we're yet, while they're young. And That's he was right. great about it. He was so cool about it. The thing, the real tribute for Randy too, that you find when you really want to know how a person is affected, or how they affect other people, I should say. Every musician, Tommy Lee. Matt Sorum, I mean, everybody I called, Chad Smith, everybody was like, he affected those people's lives in a big way. Big way, yes. And so he was an influence to the people who influence everybody. He was their influence in a lot of ways. I mean, he was the first guy, when I saw him on MTV with with uh, that band from Germany, as I forget what they were called, um, with the guy Lenny was the singer, the guy who <sighs> He became a singer of the Kingdom Come later on. Right. Was it was, called? I forget. But they, he, Randy, because he would be playing, and he, and he hit the kick drum. Boom, boom, boom. You know, boom, 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 boom. Right. God, that was so cool. So later on, when I got to know Randy, um, he, you know, that was one of the things I used to like to do all the time. And, and my drummer, Winston Watson, who played with me in Color Code, he used to do it all the time because he grew up watching Randy because he was from Arizona and he knew the Wombleys. So then uh, Randy... Um, went on and he 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 sort of also changed my life in a big way because when we met 
we were in London together working on a project when I was really young. It was after I was in Rod Stewart, but you know, I was still really young and he knew I was Native American and, and I was out of my mind. I mean, I was just booze and chicks and booze and more booze and drugs and more chicks and more sure. chicks. having a time of my life. Actually, it was actually really, <laughs> but, but Randy, Randy knew he had to have fun, but he also settled my ass down. And he, he said to me, and I think I said it in rumble. He says, I'm taking you to Indian country. Because he knew I was a native, but I didn't spend much time in, in, in Indian country. Matter of fact, I'd never been in New Mexico like that. And that's where my family's from. Um, really? I had my, no idea about that, even even of Rumble. That's yeah, my amazing. Mother, my mother was born in New Mexico in Santa Fe County, I guess, as her birth certificate says. And uh, they grew up along the border of Arizona and New Mexico, you know, uh, Apache land. That's right. But so Randy says, takes me to Taos, takes me to Santa Fe and then to Taos. And that changed my life because it became my go-to place when I really felt I needed to get grounded. When I, things were getting too crazy and I was losing my real self and I wasn't no longer thinking about music, but thinking about being a character of myself, you know, turning into a joke somewhat maybe in my own eyes. I'd go back to New Mexico and, and my boys there would set you straight because cool. yeah, cool they wanted to be famous like randy and i were but but at the same time they were grounding enough to help me be grounded so you know it wasn't like, wasn't like the going to a church where it was like you need to repent and you need to the rock and roll's evil no they were like oh i wish we could be rock stars but let me just tell you you know let's do some smudging and let's find some balance so it was great for me and it was that's all from randy that's amazing, man. That's amazing. And yeah, I mean, born and raised in New Mexico, I completely understand what you're yeah. talking about. I, yeah. There's just something, there's something there that, that, you know, like in my opinion, it doesn't really even matter where you're from. You go there and it's just, it, it's just one of those places that just grabs you by the soul. The land but, of enchantment. That's right, man. That's right. And and if you actually have native roots and you're there, I think that kind you grab, of... You it, grab it, a hold of you, for sure. Yeah. You grab a hold of you, for sure. And then and, and, and the, um, it's still that way when I go there. It's, yeah. it's, I love it there. I love yeah. it. I mean, when you have those native roots, it, it grabs you a little bit deeper, a little yeah. bit, you know, a little bit more. Yeah, I love it, man. So, I mean, we we started getting into this, and and let's just let's just go here. So, you, I'll, let me let me preface this. So, I had heard about this movie Rumble for about a year or so, and it just kind of fell off my radar for whatever reason. And one night, I'm off the road, and I'm like, you know, just. I got to find something to watch, man. The kids are asleep. Everything's cool. I got to check something out. I just want to get, get back to just, you know, I'm at home. Yeah. yeah. So I, I see this. I'm like, Oh yeah, I got to check this out. I've been wanting to do this forever. You know, Netflix then or on Amazon prime. where do you see it? at? Oh, I would probably, I think it's Netflix actually. Yeah. It's on Netflix. It's on both. Man. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, man, not only was this quite possibly the greatest just rock and roll documentary I've ever seen. It, it hit a place in me, probably because you know I uh, of of you know the native that's in me, but also because I think that you know the indigenous people get overlooked so often in this industry, and almost with everything, but especially within this, within this industry, mm -hmm. and I. I not only was just just jumping up and down and cheering and, and, and just, you know, just loving this documentary, but I'm also like looking at you just going, dude, thank you so much for bringing this to light. I've been thinking about this forever. When you and I started talking, it was after I saw this movie and I, I immediately thought of my mentor, my guru, my sensei, my guy, Wayne Perkins, who was, um, you know, he was, he was in the Rolling Stones when, when Mick Taylor left. He was the guy that played uh, with uh, uh, Bob Marley on the Catch a Fire record, you know, Concrete Jungle and, and Stir It Up and all that, right? I mean, the guy goes through Albert King to uh, Delbert McClinton to Leonard Skinner. I mean, you name it. This guy is just, he's one of those guys. But he's also very much a, 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 a proud Native man. And 
everybody has probably heard him play, but doesn't know who he is. So the fact that you were able, more. what's that? <laughs> I would have liked to have known more about him because I would have researched him more for the film. For Dude, sure. well, he's still around. We should definitely uh, hook that up. But what's amazing, though, is the fact that you that you did this. You gave this this face to the faceless. You gave the names to the nameless. And, man, it, you can't help but start doing even more of a deep dive once you watch this film. It was amazing, man. Yeah. So what What brought you to create something like this? Well, um, what happened was I was ready to retire. I'd been, you know, I, I got signed in 1988 to my first major label recording deal. And so my first solo album came out in 80, in 1990. Um, I had my, my first professional recording session was with George Clinton in 1985. I <laughs> wow. San Diego, quit my band, moved to LA. After a while, I was homeless and I, I was living on a couch at Baby O Studio where I met George Clinton and he let me plan a record. And that changed my life because then he started using me and Bootsy Collins and started using me. So by 87, I was with, working with a band called Was Not Was and we had a number one yeah. record called Walk the Dinosaur. Right. Um, at the same time, I scored an unknown small movie called Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. Oh, yeah, that small I movie. And, <laughs> and then later on, before the movie came out, I went and shot this end crazy guitar solo scene that everyone talks about now to this day, right? It's supposed to be George Carlin, but it's actually me. And um, <laughs> then at the same time, this is all 87, 88, um, I'm a staff producer for David Kirschenbaum, the famous producer who did everyone from Duran Duran to, you know, to Joe Jackson and Supertramp and I'm a staff producer for him. That's how I did Bill and Ted. He was a music supervisor. Wow. And so I'm working on all kinds of cool film soundtracks and movies for him. Uh, and then I join Andy Taylor, leaves Duran Duran. I join Andy Taylor. It's going to be my first tour. Opening for the Psychedelic First. Andy and me, uh, I thought we were getting along, but I guess he didn't like me. Oh, no. <laughs> Maybe I was a little too flashy, a little too crazy. And he, and he wussed out and fired me right before the tour. Oh, dude. Yep. But at this time, I was already flying back and forth to London a lot, playing guitar and records there. You know, Terrence Trent Darby um, was manager to bring me over. Um, I was good, working on it was not was there. We were doing Top of the Pops. I was doing I was doing all these huge TV shows in the UK, and then coming home and sleeping on my friend's futon because you know, there was no internet back then, so nobody knew what I was doing. Right. Right. It's just, but I was like hanging out with George Michael's and Bananarama and all these people doing this stuff. Did a record called Shakespeare's Sister that came out over there and went number one. And I, I remember that old record like six months ago from 15 years ago they finally sent it to me <laughs> so then all of a sudden i joined rod stewart's 1988 and i go on this whirlwind thing I meet randy castillo in 89 i go to indian country i sell a few million solo albums i also play with duran duran and i go on tour with duran duran and i go on tour with you know i play with everybody michael hutchins from in excess to, to, i mean everybody public enemy welcome to the terror dome you know, T.I., Justin Timberlake, all this kind of stuff. I do all this, these gazillion records and my own albums. And again, there's no internet, so no one knows really what the hell I'm doing. Uh, I'd go to Japan and I'd play and I'd come home and I was rich. And Steve Lukather lived up my street and he was like asking people, what, what's he doing? Is he, is he selling drugs? Because <laughs> no, I'd go to Japan and I'd get my hair ripped out and play, you know, sell 10,000 tickets in a week. And, but nobody knew it, right? So at the end of 2000, my recording career was slowing down. I was super burned out. 1999, I go play Fuji Rock in Japan. And I say, this is going to be my last concert. I'm retiring. That's it. So that year, I, 2000 hits. Um, my then girlfriend dies. And at the same time, the 2000 market crash came and I lost a million dollars in the stock market. So now... Oh, just, I'm, I can no, I can't even think about the money because I'm devastated from the death of my, of my girl, and I'm, I'm just a mess. And the, and it's like the gods called. And it was Mick Jagger, out of the blue, needs me to play guitar for him. And I wasn't playing guitar. I wasn't touching my instrument. I wasn't writing songs. I wasn't doing anything. And it's Mick Jagger though. So I get up and I go, and he starts to. It was like God sent him to me. Mick Jagger's energy was infusing me. And I was his music director and his guitarist, and he'd call me five times a day and talk about all this details of music. And, and it, it got me back going again. It, got me, it started bringing me back to life. So I started to, to tour a little again. I went to Europe. And um, 
in 2003 or 2004, I can't remember what it was, I, I um, go up to Canada to open for the Rolling Stones. While up there, I get a call from a guy called Brian Wright McLeod as a Native American writer, book writer, who's creating an encyclopedia of Native American music going all the way back to the 1908 wax cylinders of Native grass dancers. Oh my God. It's, every bit of Native American musician who's ever recorded on anything, he has it in this encyclopedia, and I'm in it a bunch, obviously. And he wants to interview me, and I want to meet him too. And when I sat down with him before those stone shows in Toronto, he starts telling me about Link Ray. And I'm like, I know Link Ray. I didn't know he was a Native American. I had no idea. He tells me about Jesse Ed Davis. I go, I spent my whole life reading Jesse Ed Davis's name on liner notes on albums. Matter of fact, he was on Atlantic Crossing, Rod Stewart's album. And when I was in Rod Stewart, I played his guitar parts. I did not know he was a Native American. I just knew the name. So Buffy, Robbie Robertson, I didn't know was a Native American. Fact is, when I, the first time I played Madison Square Garden, I've played there five or six times now, but the very first time I played, I walked on stage at Soundcheck, I was very young, 1988, and I kissed the stage. And I thought, I am the only Native American to ever play Madison Square Gardens. Little did I know what a moron idiot I am. <laughs> yes, he had played there. He played there in band concert for Bangladesh with friggin' George I'm Harris George, right. in Rico, you know? He played there, Robbie played there, Buffy's probably played there, you know? So I'm, I have no knowledge of any of this. And I said to myself, if I have no knowledge of this and I'm in this business, I need to show Native American people that these are heroes and that they have role models they don't know about. That, so you don't have to go back 150 years ago and talk about Sitting Bull and Geronimo or whatever. We can go back and there's some people right here in the current times that did some things that, against impossible, near impossible. They proved it can be done and it should inspire people. So I thought, what should I do? I'm gonna make a coffee table book. I'm gonna make a uh, something like, you know, and then what happened was um, I started producing television in 2006 in Canada. Um, and I started to realize that TV was, film was where I had to go. And um, we, I worked, helped build a studio on the Six Nations Reservation called Jucasa with a guy called Kenny Hill, who was a really rich Mohawk guy, a self-made guy who wanted to build this beautiful studio. And I gave a speech at the opening and Tim Johnson from the Smithsonian was there. I go to the Smithsonian, I tell him the story of these natives, just like I told you. And he says, let's do an exhibit. And that's how it started. Wow. It was that. Then after the exhibit was successful, I went about and I said, I'm making a movie. And I went and made the movie. I that's, that's how it happened. That's, that's, that's what it was. It wasn't like I had this vision. I'm going and, and, and I only made the film for native people to show that they had some heroes. I didn't know it was going to come out and change written history in America. I didn't know I was going to be in Australia and Hungary and, and Germany and, and, and all over the world, Japan. And, and I'm showing this movie to sold out theaters and speaking. I had no idea, no idea. So, I mean, I like to act like I, I'm so smart. I'm <laughs> not lucky, man. I just got lucky. Dude, I, I love hearing that so much just because it, it really does seem like just everything aligned for you, right? And you know, I'm you right now, things align for me a lot in my life. I'm a lucky, lucky person, but I've had bad shit, bad shit. When shit is really bad, it's really bad. And when it's been good, it's better than you could ever dream of. There's not a lot of middle ground for me my whole life. So I, I wrote a book about it and I went and realized it. You know, God, I, I was born strangling from the umbilical cord. Oh, so I already came out of the box, I was fighting for life. And blue, my, my father said. And, you know, and then from that I sprung to, you know, I mean, it's like extremes with me. So I'm just a lucky person, I think. I'm a very lucky person. Well, man, I mean, you've also played with, with everybody and as we were talking uh, before, right, you've played on on some of my favorite records just ever, right? I mean, when you were talking about Mick Jagger, you were you were doing the uh, Goddess in the Doorway record. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That record was unreal. That oh, that thing yeah. was, was, I mean, it was just like, okay, outside of the Stones, Mick kind of, you know, he, he's doing his thing, and it was really, really good. I didn't know that you were on that. And, you know, when I started researching a little bit more, I was like, man, there we go. There we go. And then and then you got, you know, the guy that one of the guys that I, I absolutely, you know, look at as, as being someone that, that gave me my start and introduced me to touring was Jeff Healy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I, and I was with Jeff, too. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I mean, and and I just got done reading Tom Stevens' book, and your name oh. was all over there. Tom put some stuff in that book. I'm like, Tom, you can't tell. <laughs> When I all of us came from that era of rock, Randy Castillo, all of us, are, what was acceptable then maybe is not so acceptable now. And you read about it now, you're like, whoa. But back then, you're like, whoa. I'm like, Tom, I read that book. I was like, Tom. Oh, man. <laughs> that book, I opened it up. I'm like, oh. And I'm like, passed out against the wall. <laughs> <laughs> and then well, uh, and then you did the Terrence Trent Darby uh, vibrator record. I right? did vibrator, and I did his symphony or damn. The one man. before. And I was as a music director as well. God. You know, I just, you know, whether, I, you know, I get Steven Tyler calls me. I play with Steven Tyler. And it, the thing is, most of the people I play with or work with were people that I idolized as coming up. And I was, a, I'm a fan, you know? I mean, part of it is Bootsy Collins and George Clinton and Bill Laswell. Those guys gave me a foundation of credibility mm -hmm. where people think that even if I'm really not that good, they assume I'm that good and that's enough to get you in the door, right? And um, then I just got lucky, you know, you, you get to play with, you know, if Steven Tyler knows I'm the guy that played with Mick Jagger and Mick Jagger, Mick Jagger knows I'm the guy that did, you know, this amazing black artist he loves, or, you know, it's like, it's, it's picking and choosing along the pathway of your career. Like for instance, I worked at American Idol from 2006 to 2010 as a music director and a consultant. And I did Daughtry, um, Jordan Sparks, David Cook, Adam Lambert, Chris Allen, and Allison Irita in those four years. It was the highest rated show in the world during those four years. But I could have done American Idol years earlier. I hated the show. And, and I thought, I don't want to do this shit. It's like live karaoke. And I said, I refuse to do any of those shows. Rockstar, Supernova. I was like, no way. None of that crap. Right. But by the time I did Idol, it was the biggest game in town. So it was okay. If I would have done American Idol in 2002, Mick Jagger would never have asked me to be his guitar player or music director. Never. He didn't want the guy from American Idol in his band. Right. He wanted the other guy. He didn't even like the fact that I played with Rod Stewart, I don't think. He used wow. Make, he used to make jokes about me playing with Rod Stewart. Because I'd be like, wait, how'd you get my number? And he goes, I got it from Rod Stewart. So, you know, <laughs> yeah. You know. But I mean, when I was a kid playing with Rod Stewart in 1988, he yelled at me about Mick Jagger. And I didn't oh, man. <laughs> That's I awesome. To, I heard the song Bitch on the radio. We were in Kansas City in our dressing room going ready to go on stage. I go, we should cover the song. We got a horn section. He goes, That's the, that's the enemy. That's our competition. You know, like, <laughs> you know so I don't know. But it, the key is picking and choosing. Who you decide to play with is going to reflect your career the rest of your life. So if you pick, for instance, I'll give you a good example. One of my best friends in the world, one of the most amazing musicians and singers is Richie Kotzen. Richie was my neighbor growing up in Hollywood. I was yes. like, I'm like his big brother, a few years older than him. And him and I went everywhere together. Like, like he doesn't trust a lot of people. And he, him and I were just, we love each other. Best, best brothers, man. Well, he decided to join Poison when CeCe left. Right. He was way too good for that gig, but they were famous, but they were on the way down. Grunge was coming in, right? Right. Joined the band, he made a lot of money, and then he left the band because it was a disaster. Um, okay, fast forward now to the mid 90s, mid late 90s. He gets a call to audition for Nine Inch Nails, I think it was. He, they don't want to audition him because they don't think he's cool. They think he's one of those guitar hero guys. That's not right. Really, his image is amazing. He's plain, isn't it? And he, he he's just spreads, blows the room away, just eats everything alive, I mean, like he does. And, and was, he was Trent Reznor, he's like, God, because I, I didn't want to like you. I just can't believe how great you are. And he goes, he goes, I've been trying to figure this out. He goes, I want you in my band. But I'm trying to, to, to ask myself, what am I going to do the first time someone from a radio station, a TV show or a magazine puts a mic in front of my face and says, so what made you hire the guy from Poison? <laughs> oh man. He goes, he goes, I just can't do it. So the choice that Richie made for Poison, <clears throat> although it was great for him at the time, I'm sure he has no regrets. But sure. that, it stopped him later on when music changed from getting another gig. Rod Stewart almost could have been that way for me, but I had George Clinton and Bootsy Collins always to fall back on. And, and ironically, writers used to always want to talk in the press and on TV about Bootsy and George, Thomas Dolby, Don Was, 
They never wanted to talk about Rod Stewart. They didn't take him seriously, but but I took Rod super serious because when you Absolutely. listen to the records and you listen to all that early stuff, Infatuation, and I, I mean, those records are just amazing. And Out of Order, the tour I did when he was using the power station, yeah, my jam. You know, that was Tony Thompson and Carmine Rojas and Bowie. And so, you know, I could look past that, but certain gigs people can't look past. And luckily, I never had that gig in my repertoire that stopped somebody super cool from wanting to associate with me. I'm going to take a short break from my conversation with Stevie Salas to ask you some questions. Did you happen to hear that little piece of bumper music? Did you hear that solo? Did you hear that tone? <laughs> Have you ever checked out the theme song to this show? I'm asking you this not just because I want you all to go check out my music. Of course I want you to go hear my music. But I'm asking you this because if you're paying attention, if you're listening to it, then you've heard me play Go Dan Guitars. I love Godan guitars. Let me say it again. I love Godan guitars. I will wave that that Godan guitars flag so high. These guys out in Canada have been making exquisite instruments for years. They're beloved by players all around the world, man. And I'll tell you what, they just keep pushing the envelope of creativity. They're always cutting edge. They've got something for everybody, whether it be, you know, just a very classic kind of look and feel and sound and instrument to just something completely hot rotted. They're outstanding. They feel great. They look great. They sound great. Right? Their tone, man, it's, it, it's, it's a million dollar tone, but I'll tell you what, they don't break the bank. That's another beautiful thing about them. There's something for everybody. These guys, talking about pushing the envelope of creativity, they just released a new line called the Radium X, and I just want to tell you just a little bit about it. This guitar, quite possibly, out of any company, may be the most versatile guitar that you'll ever come across. It's got something for everybody, from, from jazz cats and blues cats to, to full-on rock and roll and, and heavy metal. It's all in there. These beautiful glassy highs to just, you know, that, that heavy metal raucous, that good old stuff with the distortions. It's all in there. And on top of that, they even added acoustic in there as well. You can get this thing to have an acoustic sound as well. How they do it, I don't know. It's magic. It's wizardry, I say. It's wizardry. But it's good wizardry because it sounds so good. Those of you that know me know I'm a total tone junkie and I value my sound so very much. These guys have turned my head. These guys have won me over. And I am a proud, proud player of Good Down Guitars. And I hope that you will listen to this, check them out, and go explore for yourself. And especially check out the Radio MX. It's great. So if you want to check them out, www.godanguitars.com that's g-o-d-i-n guitars.com check out what they have in store for you and if you find something you like and you want to get in touch with them you let them know that your buddy KV sent you let's get back to this interview here on The Approach That's amazing. And I mean, and again, you've played with everybody, but I mean, you obviously had a start. Where did you start? Where, where was your beginning? I was um, in Oceanside, California, where I'm from. I'm not there now. I'm at my house in Austin, Texas, but I, um, I was, uh, went to high school there. I started playing guitar at 15. I realized this is kind of easy for me. This is kind of like kind of easy. I surfed every day and I skateboarded every day and I played guitar and I played guitar like I surfed. You know, we had a surfing sort of an energy to the way I play, the way I attack. So it's a little bit punk rock, a little bit, you know, hard rock, a little metal. I don't know. Because I love, I could easily listen to Montrose and UFO and Rush and also love the Ramones and Joe Jackson. and Yeah, uh, man. Bello. I loved it all. And growing up in San Diego, North County, our bands could play all those songs and the kids liked them all. The surfer kids loved all of it. So I didn't have to just be metal and I didn't just have to be punk rock. I didn't have to be any of that. And I, so I got a, a rounded idea of how to play. You know, if I'm playing Pump It Up by Elvis Costello, I might play it more like Eddie Van Halen would play it, but still. <laughs> but the guy sings it like Elvis, and it's, you know, there was a great hybrid for me. 
And so um, by the time I was 17, my high school band was becoming the most popular band in San Diego, North County, San Diego. We were, I, you know, I was the youngest. I was the only one in high school. The rest of the guys got were a little older. And, but they were, you know, only a year or older, two years older. I think the oldest one was three years older than me. And um, they all went to my high school graduation. But our band was playing high school dances in, in local bars, you know, at clubs at the beach and kids clubs and stuff. And we, right. we were like Duran Duran. The girls were screaming and going crazy. And, and I, I just realized this is not that hard for me. So I did that. Graduated from high school and in 1985. I'd been touring the Southwest with that band, This Kids, we were called. Uh, and I just realized, I don't think we're going to make it. I think we're super good, but I don't think we're going to make it. I need to move to L.A. and try it. So I quit the band, which was, you know, I, the band was making a lot of money, too. I, mean, I drove a Porsche. I was, like, doing well. My band Damn. Great. But I, I lost everything. I moved to L.A., and after eight months, I was homeless. I kept it. I lost everything but the Porsche. I kept the Porsche because uh, psychologically, I knew that in L.A., when I pulled up to a club or a restaurant and I had my Porsche, People will see me and assume that I must be a successful person, not a loser. And it was super important in L.A. then the, 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 how, how people saw you. The perception, yeah. It was super important. And, uh, and then by 88, I was already playing stadiums with Rod Stewart. So I just got real lucky. Went bam, bam, bam. It was like almost unheard of. You know, it was unheard of what happened to me. One of the other things that I really love about you and and what you do how you do is the fact that you're so versatile right you can go and do the whole like you know eddie van halen thing but you could also go out and play with george clinton right that's my, that's my thing that i took pride in it's also the thing that made me not get super famous by the way because i i could do too too much instead of doing like eddie van halen did one thing he did it perfect and just gigantic you know and i I would get bored doing one thing. So I would like do a color code, let's say my, my solo album. I tour the year and I, I come back and I'm in all the guitar magazines, you know, Reader's Poll, number one in Japan, number three in America, best new guitarist, all this shit. And then what do I do? I go on tour, with, you know, Terrence Trent Darby and Duran Duran when I'm playing funk music all night. And I, cause I love the songs. I love this voice, you know? So, and then I come back a year later and I'm, you know, made the, I made the Back from the Living album at the same time I made Sash Jordan Rats. I wrote and produced it at the same time I did an album right. called Power, which Randy Castile played on. And I would do all these records and put them out at different times and I'd go tour and I'd get bored and I'd do something else, do Michael Hutchins and go and solo from NXS. I do this right. You know, and it gave me a long career, but it kept me from being world famous, I think. Um, Guys like you who know music go, oh my God, I see this guy's name attached to a lot of shit. Everywhere. <laughs> most people, but most people don't know me when I walk down the street, right? They do now because of Rumble. And people walk up to me in the airport and say, you're the Rumble guy. And I'm like, I am. That's that's you. God, yeah. but what a cool yeah, but, thing to be known but, for, man, right? You know, versatility was my thing because when I was in 1985, I'm in LA and I've said to myself, I had to come to the harsh reality was I'm good, but I'm not that good. I'll never be as good as Eddie Van Halen, okay? Um, but maybe I could play like Nile Rodgers, because I love funk music. Yeah, man. Be funk, but I could do it through Marshalls. And I could, you know, I try to come up with this concept of what would be my thing. And I remember I got signed with Color Code doing this funk rock thing. And mm -hmm. I, uh, Tom Morello had a band called Lock Up, and he got signed at the same time. And the Chili Peppers were doing more like punk. Uh, Fishbone was more like way outside. We used to play together at Matt, at, uh, at Madame Wong's and all these clubs. Right. And then uh, and then Living Color came out. And Ed Stasium did that album, you know, Cult of Personality, and that became kind of a thing. And then it's the drag was after Living Color. It started to become a thing more. They talked more about the color of my skin than music, and that really sucked. That really sucked. I did an album in 94 for Warner Brothers and uh, with Bernard Fowler called uh, Nickel Bag. And it's me, Doug Wimbish, who's now the bass player of Living Color. Right. Um, Bernard, uh, Bill Laswell, Tim Stevens, George Clinton, Mudbone Cooper, Bernie Worrell, yeah. uh, Brian Tishy, um, Zach Alfred. We're all playing on this record in New York and L.A. and Connecticut. And, and um, I get on a radio call with my old head of radio named Dave Darris. They called him Rambo. He goes, hang on, don't say a word. And I had a song called Love Song on the Nickel Bag album. And now we call ourselves the IMS. So you can find it online. It's Stevie Sells Love Song. It's an amazing song. And it's blowing up at radio in a bunch of cities. It's like, 
on the cover, me and Bernard Fowler painted our faces silver because we did not want someone to see my Native American skin and his black skin and assume what kind of record it was. We wanted them to hear the music. So we wanted to take away that. So we painted our faces silver on the cover. So no one would know our nationality, our, our, our ethnic background. Wow. And uh, the song's blowing up. So Dave Darris calls the head of radio at this, I forget what it was. And he says to Dave, man, that song's great. He goes, but do you think America is ready for a second band with the black lead singer? And I was just like, I knew right then we were, we were fucked. I knew right then. That's what they're talking about? Wow. That was narrative in 1994, 95, right. four, something That's the narrative? I knew right then we were fucked. And Bernard Fowler knew he had a smash record. He knew he had a big record. It was his dream record. And when he found that out, he cried. He cried like a, like a, like a kid. He broke his heart so bad that at that still, that late in the game, he, he'd been in a Rolling Stone since 88. And he's still dealing with that. Unbelievable. And, you know, I don't harp on racism. You know, you don't see me on on, on things like, I, I, I want to talk about solutions. I don't want to talk about problems. But, I mean, it was real. It was real. Absolutely. I just yeah. didn't make that the narrative of my life. But that happened. You know what it was? I don't know if I was thriving. What it was was I made a ton of money. When you make money, it appears to be thriving. What happened was in the mid-90s, my Color Code albums were doing huge business in other parts of the world, Japan especially, in Europe, Germany. And I was getting these recording contracts where they were giving me my own label and paying, licensing the record from me at a half a million dollars an album. But all of a sudden, I'm getting a half a million dollars. In 1995, it was a ton of money. Yeah, Pro man. Plus a ton of money for the videos. And it's going straight into my bank account. And, and I'm getting rich like a mug because I own these masters and I happen to make this, get this amazing contract. And... We're in, and then also, instead of having a band where you, you make a million dollars and you split it four ways and pay your manager, I didn't have anybody to pay. And so people, you know, I'm driving a Merc and I'm owning houses and I'm doing this stuff. And so I appeared to be super successful, but I wasn't so content. I wanted my records to be hits in America and I had very little success in America. I had critical success always. The critics love me. Critics, critics, Steve Sauce, great, what a legend, blah, blah, blah. But, and I wanted a hit record in America. I didn't, I always, during those years, I was on a, I was on a twelve hour flight three times a month, and I'm not complaining because you know I was lucky to have that. Right. But I had success in America, and and it was you know it, it was crushing to me that I can never find it. They you know and then in the mid '90s everybody was a fake punk rocker, and um, you know I play in the MC5 now. You know what I mean? I play in the original real punk rock band, and I, I mean I play with Wayne Kramer. You know, but at the time, it was like all these metal guys were cutting their hair short and pretending to be punk rockers. Everything in L.A. and everything in America was so fake. And in the other places, they listened to artists and they loved you. You didn't have to have a single for them to love you. They loved you or they didn't love you. Right. And um, it ate me up every day that I was trying to figure out how to crack that nut of being successful in America. And I just couldn't figure it out. That leads me to this. What is the difference between the biz back then? And now? Oh, there is no biz now. That's the difference. Back then, okay, let me just tell you what, what would happen. It's 1985, I moved to LA. After a bunch of months, I have these little eight track demos. A guy called Dino Irali hears them. He says, Who's playing guitar? I'm like, I am. He goes, That's fucking amazing. I go, Really? And, and he goes, Who wrote the songs? I go, I did. He goes, Well, shit. And he, and he, he used to be an AR guy at Restless, right? Restless. Yeah, it was. It was George Harrison's label at AM, Dark Horse. So he he takes it to a guy called Carter at AM and says, Listen to this kid. I meet the guy. He says, Well, this is pretty interesting. Here's ten thousand bucks. Uh, I want you to go into the studio, come back and see me in a month and work on a couple tracks and blah blah blah. So I do that. Ten thousand bucks, just give it to me. It's like, fuck it. And that time in my life, that was a that was a fortune. Yeah, man. If I go there, I do it, I come back, play him some demos, and he's like, hmm. This one sucks. Well, this, come on, this is shit. Hey, this one's pretty interesting. What's this? And this is okay. I like this a little bit too. Here's another ten thousand dollars. I want you to call this guy who's an engineer. I think he'd be good. And there's a drummer or whatever, you know, named blah blah blah. And go try to work up this and get in a few more of these things and come back and see him. So that and I'd go do that. I'd come back and see him. And um, 
oh, this is great, but it's, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna pass. I'm like, oh, crap, I didn't get a record deal. But then the guy at Electra heard those demos and he said, wait, this is badass. So he gives me 20 grand. He says, I'm gonna go to London, <laughs> go to London and work with this engineer and there's a guy here and then you're gonna go to Holland. There's a studio I want you to try there with this kid. I think he'd be great, you know. And that, and it was called artist development. That's what that was called. They would develop you. You would spend a lot of money developing. Before they gave you millions of dollars, you would spend tell tens of thousands getting developed as a songwriter. And then I got a publishing deal offer. And blah, 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 blah. Nancy Walker wants to sign me to MI. You know, and it was called development. And there's no development now. Zero. Right. They started development in the mid 90s, pretty much in the late 90s. They would just be, can you get on KROQ? If you can get on KROQ in, in 1998, go get a record deal. Right. You know, but that's stupid. And, um, mm -hmm. There was no more development. He also encouraged me at a young age to be incredibly as unique and original as I could be. And um, during the end of the 90s, I had to figure out how to try to sound like something else so I could get on the radio at K-Rock. Wow. And it, that, that's the difference from that. Now, you don't even have any development, you know? And if you get a record deal, they don't give you anything. They put the record out and it goes on Spotify. And even if it plays 300 million times, you get a check for 50 bucks. It's like, it sucks. I feel bad for young artists now, you know? What advice would you give to young artists right now? I would say do whatever the fuck you want and, and don't try to fit in, try to not fit in. Because right now, right now they're realizing that this algorithm of every artist that sounds exactly the same isn't really moving units like the old records are. They're realizing that most people play the old records now, 80%. Right. Um, so listen to classic stuff. Listen to great stuff, lots of it, and become, yeah, let's face it, that one band, what are they called? Uh, they sound like they're Led Zeppelin ripoff, and they have a great career. Yeah, Greta and, Van Fleet. Yeah, I mean, they're pretty much a Zeppelin ripoff. Listen, they listen. sound like Zepp, yeah. I mean, they're already trying to do everything about it, and the young kids don't even know who Led Zeppelin is, so it's like, you know what I mean? So I, I go back and listen to this stuff and create something more original. Um, and then also my motto for me is I like to be the dumbest guy in the room. I want to be the worst, least talented guy in the room and surround myself with the best. A lot of people like to surround themselves with shitty people so they feel better about themselves. I want to be the shittiest fucking guy sitting at that table. I want to be, I want to steal everything I can from them. If I sit with Phil X, my favorite guitar player, I love him. Yeah, he's great. Phil used to steal shit from me. <laughs> so now nice. I, I still ship from Phil. You know what I mean? It's like, I mean, I was playing with Ricky Medlock last two weeks ago in, uh, in uh, Canada for an event. And, you know, Ricky's a great Sioux Indian guitar player from Leonard Skinner. I mean, I'm going to watch him and I'm going to steal everything I can. And I know he does the same to me. Watch, surround yourself with the greatest people and learn all you can. And, and do not, because if you steal it and you watch it and you interpret what that is by the time you get home, from here to your hands, it's probably going to be a little different. And by that point, it might actually be your original stuff. Yes. Yes. Right? So you've also, you're, you're also like just Mr. Busy, man. I, you know, trying to even just set up this interview and whatever. It's always been, you know, you're, you're here, you're there, you're, you're doing this, that, and the other. But I did see recently that you were out with, uh, with, uh, Matt Sorum, with Carmen Rojas, uh, yes. man, West Studi, you but my, you know, another buddy of mine. You know, Wes? Yeah. You know. Oh, dude. Santa Fe, man. Yeah. 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 Yep. Many nights at El Farol. <laughs> a charity I work with called the Dreamcatcher Charitable Foundation on Six Nations in Canada. And I've been working with them for about 11 years. And what it was, I started bringing up Wes, Graham Greene, Tantu Cardinal. I started inviting all my native superstar friends to this event because it's a native charity for native people. Matt Sorum comes and plays. We, we played the event two Thursdays ago in Canada on the, on the Indian Reservation, mind you, with me and Billy Gibbons. Matt Sorum on drums, Carmine Rojas on bass, you know, super band. Yeah. And, and then uh, I invited native guys like George Leach and, and, and Gary Farmer to come up and play with us. <laughs> no, Gary, much, sure. you know, Gary lives in New Mexico. Yeah. So, you know, and then the native people in the audience freak out because they're like, wow, look at they're playing with the big boys. I don't know, you know if they think of me as native anymore. I think they just, you know, he's one of the big boys. I'm not, though. I'm a native guy. And, uh, it's uh, it was pretty fascinating. You know, I I played with Gibbons a lot. I played with Gibbons in San Diego recently at San Diego. He's uh, outstanding, man. Uh, I, yeah, I, I've I've toured with uh, with Zizi and I, I did a a run with he and, and Matt Sorum and Austin Hanks. Oh yeah. Yeah, 
man, and that thing was that was probably that might have been one of my favorite tours that I have ever done. Did and, you wear pajamas? Did you wear pajamas on stage? Those guys were all wearing pajamas when I went and saw. Them. Oh yeah! Oh yeah! Absolutely, absolutely, and I mean, you know, going grocery shopping with Gibbons is is also an experience, you know. But I mean, like you were saying, just soaking things in, learn as much as you can, right? Yeah. Uh, God, I, 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 you know, total, you know, a bucket list moment for me was being able to play, you know, Gibbons guitar through his rig. And was just floored. Like, did it sound like? Did you sound like him when he, when he played? Uh, no, man, no. And that's the that's the thing. And and as a guitar player, it's always like, well, yeah, y you have your own sound. You that's that's the coolest thing, in my opinion. And this is just me going off here. But as a guitar player, having your own unique sound, you could play through Gibbons rig. You could play through Richie's rig. You could play through your rig. If it was me playing through any of those rigs, it's not going to sound like Gibbons or you or Cotson or whatever, right? That's the, that's might the, be. the great the great guys sound like them. That's yes. Either way, you can hear some yourself on the radio and you can go, oh, that, that's Stevie Salt's playing right there. That's, that was the goal always. You know, you know when you hear Jeff Beck or you hear Clapton. Or you, you know, right. Stevie, I knew it was Stevie Ray Vaughan. You know, that's the real goal for all musicians, I think. You know, um, I, I remember in 1990, my, my album Color Code came out. Uh, and I, the first day it came out, I went on tour opening for Joe Satriani, flying in a Blue, Blue Dream tour, which I hated, by the way. But I love Joe. But every night I was playing in front of 5,000 dudes watching my thing. <laughs> right. The stress, the stress level was so intense and so hard. I had to play at my best. You know, after that point, every band that ever opened for Satriani got booed off the stage. They wouldn't last more than two weeks. And I was on the tour for six or eight months. Wow. And I'd get innovations every night. But I was miserable. I mean, I had anxiety every night. Oh, my God, I'm a sucker. And um, I remember one time I, I grabbed Joe's guitar through his Marshalls and through his rig. And I played through it. And it sounded awful. I mean, I sounded awful. I mean, awful with his sound. And then he puts it on. It's just like, -na 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 -na. it was just like, what? So, right. yeah. Sound is, is right here, you know, this is what you want, everyone. Right, well, I mean, Gibbon, you know. Gibbon said to me last week, two weeks ago, we were on an airplane together. We were flying to Texas. And um, I have my own pedals out and stuff. And this, I have an overdrive preamp called the Nishi Drive. It's made for me by LA Custom in, LAA Custom in Italy. And Gibbons loves the way they sound because I can plug it into a shitty rental fender and it makes it just sound amazing. So finally, I gave it to him. He goes, you know, when you got that sound, Stevie, uh, blah, 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 blah. I go, no, 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 it isn't from that box. Maybe it has something to do with these. Yeah, man. And he's like, yeah, but I was kidding, you know, but it's like, you know. Well, it's always a trip, too, because as you know, I mean, Gibbons plays the lightest of strings. Sevens. Like, yeah, sevens. The guy plays seven seven gauge strings, and, and for those of you that are not guitar players, that is, it's it's nothing. Like dental floss. Yeah, it really is. It's I mean, you know, even dental floss might even be thicker than those strings are. But no, I, I no pedals. Yeah, no pedals, man. He's just he's just doing his thing. But here's the other thing too: his guitars are are all uh, chambered. They're all hollowed out, and they're they're really ridiculously light. So I just I'll never forget playing his guitar. I felt like I was going to break the thing because it was so light, you know, and big guy, whatever. It's all, it's all good. I thought I was literally going to like, you know, Hulk smash, Hulk crash, <laughs> Billy Gibbons guitar, ah, you know, and then, you know, as playing, you know, his strings, I didn't feel them. Literally, I didn't feel them under my fingers. And, and maybe it's because I play, you know, thick ass strings or whatever, but that was such an amazing thing. So not only... Did I not sound like Gibbons? Not only, you know, like I, I couldn't, I couldn't even function with that guitar. You got to change your whole feel. Right. And then there he goes being Gibbons yeah. and sounding like, you know, sounding like solo, Gibbons. The solos punch through. I don't, it's, I don't know how he does it. You know, I don't either, man. Maybe we talked about Jeff Healy. I used to grab his guitar and jam on it. And he, he had like probably like 14s for an E string. I mean, I, they, my fingers would be like, I couldn't even, they were like, ugh. I couldn't even play the thing. It was so gnarly. It was so the strings, strings were so thick. God, I don't know. Yeah. Um, I, I recently, you know, I was always on tens, but on uh, my in Abasala's Japanese tour, I, I have a project with a guy called Koshinabu, the biggest selling artist in the history of the band. So over a hundred million records, and we, we do this fun thing called the Abasala's 
we pick whoever we want. We had Matt Sherrod from uh, playing drums from he was uh, in Crowded House and Beck, and he plays with me, works with me a lot. Uh, we had uh, Stuart Stuart Zender from Jimmy Corey playing bass, and we had uh, Amp Fiddler from P Funk, who I started with with George Clinton in '85 playing synths. Uh, and we uh, were going out, and I actually felt like a wuss. But I called my best friend Jimmy Dunlap, and I said, "Send me nines. I'm going back. <laughs> I haven't been on nines since, since my high school band." But I'm playing nines now, and I'm like, although I use tens at the festival I played last week in the Yukon, tuned down a half step. Right. But realistically, the nines started making love to me. They were feeling pretty good. Somebody going to do a Jesse Ed like? They need to do a Jesse Ed story, man. He played with all four Beatles. I mean, Jesus. Right. Played with right. the Stones. You know, he played with, played with Faces, Rod Stewart. God, right. I mean, Jackson David. Brown, for God's sake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on. I mean, dude, yeah, he was he was everywhere. I just, he, again, he man. Tell, he, was, he was John Lennon's favorite guitar player. That's, see, and that that's an amazing thing, right? Kind of. Well, right. I mean, that just the just the whole thing. I, and again, like these are the things that you start finding out. You start digging deeper, and the coolest thing is you did that for us in a big way with your film, man. That's and amazing. that's such a that's such a cool thing. I mean, just going back to Charlie Patton, right? Yeah, yeah. I had no idea, but when you start if looking at it, and if I had a dollar for everybody that walked up to me and said I had no idea. I'd be rich as shit. That's what that movie does. Everyone says, I had no idea. Yeah. Everyone says that. Right. I mean, <laughs> but that one in particular, it's like it was it when you showed it, it was almost like that makes total sense. And then when you put the 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 you know the chance side by side with what he was playing, it was like here's what it is. You're brought up to believe a narrative. You're a little kid. You go to school every day, and they make you watch milk commercials. Milk's good for you. You gotta have milk. Three meals a day, blah. And so you grow up saying milk good for you. You have no idea. You don't question it. So you get brought up. I was brought up believing the Delta Mississippi Delta blues scene was an African American art form, a black art form, completely. One day, Billy Gibbons says to me, "Well, two things happen. My neighbor's a guy called Charlie Sexton. He lives around the corner. <laughs> yeah, one day." I'm so one day I'm out jogging. I've known Charlie since we were kids, right? So Charlie's out in front of Mona's lawn. And you can picture that. Charlie's sex in his rubber, rubber boots and his shorts and Mona's lawn. Right. Charlie, Charlie and I start talking. And he goes, listen. And he goes, anybody who's anybody. He goes, everybody thinks that the, uh, the blues uh, representation is Robert Johnson because he has the sexy story with the crossroads. He goes, but anybody who's anybody knows it's Charlie Patton. Yeah, man. Really? So then one day, Billy Gibbons, I'm, I'm at this thing jam, and I'm hanging out with him and Slash in his back room, and he goes, come here, baby. He brings his phone up. I have a photo of him. He's staring at his phone. And I make a joke saying he's te you know, teaching me something about UFOs or something when I post it. <laughs> God. He showed me a picture of Charlie Patton. He goes, looks to me like he's got some wavy, blonde, curly hair. And he was right. You just assume it. It's a black and white photo you've been told that he's African-American, and you just assume, not knowing anything about the African-Americans and the, and the Native Americans merging and, you know, where they all live together in slavery and the escaped slaves and all this thing with the Native Americans and the Irish and the Scottish being all pushed out right. you know, for people. Really, it's about who has money and who doesn't have money, and it's still like that today. God, yeah. Uh, I, I urge everybody, it doesn't matter who you are, go check out this movie it's on netflix it's on uh, amazon yeah. find it anywhere you can canada it's on uh crave hbo canada it's on netflix canada it's all over the place man. it's all it's over the, and it's so good quite possibly like i said my favorite rock and roll documentary of all well, time the it's called rumble the indians that rock the world so that's know. that's right rumble <laughs> yeah let's i mean i will say it and say it and say it again you know this is so good. Rumble is the name of the movie. And I mean, you know, Stevie is, is, is just one of the good guys in the biz who has been there, done that. And then makes an incredible movie. It's just, it's, it's outstanding, man. It's outstanding. So yeah, we're well, going to get lucky. Sometimes you got to get lucky. Sometimes Ken. It, exactly, man. And I'm sure luck has a, a, has a big part of it, man, but it couldn't have happened to a better guy. Right. So there you go. Thank you for spreading the word too, man. Yeah, man, dude, I will continue to do so because I, I believe not only is it such a cool thing to watch, a great movie, not only is it that, 
I believe that it's so educational. And again, I, I, I just, I thank you so much for, for doing that. What an amazing feat, man. Thank, thank, thank the gods. Cause they were on my shoulder. They made it happen. I was just a, 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 a conveyor belt that got it done by accident. Indeed, know? man. Indeed. <laughs> Indeed. Usually at the end of this thing, man, and I'm, I'm kind of fascinated with this one. What we do is I'm just going to ask you these rapid fire questions. Top three favorite guitar players. Mick Ronson. Um, Ronnie Montrose. Brian May. If you could put together your dream band, living or dead, doesn't really matter who would be in it. I would have um, David Bowie would be my singer. I would have um, Mick Ronson on guitar. I would have Dave Grohl on drums. Nice. And I would have um, who would I want on bass that I haven't played? I played all the best bass players in the world. Right. I would say um, John Entrussell on bass. That's a good one, man. Top three Desert Island records. Montrose's first album, Kiss's first album. Oh, no, no, Kiss Alive one, and James Brown's Star Time. All right. If you could tour with one band, or if you could be a member of it, if somebody just left and, and you're going to be that guy, who would it be? The only person I didn't play with that I said, said I was going to spend my life playing with, and I played with his band after he died with David Bowie, and David Bowie's the only gig that I, I almost did it, and I was going to do it, and I didn't do it, and he's the only regret I have in my life that I never did Man. with Bowie, and I wanted to play with Bowie really bad, and, and it was supposed to happen, and it didn't, and I didn't make it happen, and I didn't know he was going to die. And, you know, it's just Unbelievable. Boy, well, last one for you. What song do you wish you wrote? Going for the one by Yes. Wow, that's cool, man. That's very hip. What are you up to these days, man? Like, what? anything cool going on right now? Everything's cool. Native American Charity, the Dreamcatcher Charitable Foundation. Um, working in Indian country for me is really great. Uh, making movies. I got a movie company, a film company in the middle of, I'm making a movie right now with Donna Carey, the writer, producer of The Simpsons. Um, I'm doing all kinds of stuff. I love um, it. Being with my son, this is the best thing in the world. I got a son's fourth, 15 now, and I, I love being a dad. So that's why you see me flying a lot. I was with my son's got a football game. I fly home. I don't care if I'm in friggin' Indonesia. I'm coming home for that football game. Dig it. I am um, being a dad is my number one thing. I'm super into these days. I love it, man. I love it. Brother man. Yeah. You, you're the guy rumble, 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 rumble. Y'all got to go check that out, dude. Where can people find you? Stevie Sauce uh, official on Instagram is the easiest. Or StevieSauce.com. I get a lot of messages sent to me there. Beautiful, man. And Stevie Sauce. You know, people leave messages on Twitter as well and Facebook. But uh, Instagram is probably the easiest. My guy. Well, there you go, everybody. This is Stevie Salas. Man, thank you so much for hanging with me, bro. Thank you, Ken. Thanks for being patient. And thanks for doing this great work. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, that about does it. Oh, man. What a, what a conversation. I'd like to thank my friend Stevie Salas for joining me. I mean, wasn't that just like a giant who's who? For real, right? I mean, the guy knows everybody, and he's played with everybody, and he's been on these iconic, amazing records. I mean, he's, he's a legend. He's a legend in this business. He's also a best-selling author, and he's also a philanthropist, and of course, a filmmaker. With that said, you guys go check out Rumble, the Indians that rock the world. Rumble, 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 Rumble. Man, wherever you can find that film, I know it's on Netflix, it's on Amazon Prime, wherever you stream movies, go check it out. I'm gonna go as far as to say, that movie should be shown in classrooms. Everybody, everybody, whether you're into music or not, should check this movie out because really, <laughs> it, it shines a light on a culture that has been overlooked for far too long, especially when it comes down to the music that we all love and listen to. I mean, it's, it's really something to behold. Wow. 
great job, Stevie Salas. I am honored to have you on the show. I'm honored to call you a friend. Thank you again. I also want to thank Godan Guitars. Go check them out, y'all. They make exquisite instruments. Exquisite instruments, just like the Radium X. Oh, yeah. If you are digging this show and you want to, you know, check out a little bit more, Go to our brand new Patreon page, www.patreon.com slash Ken Valdez Approach. Over there, hey man, you never know. I just might pop up the videos of these particular conversations that I'm having, and I'm going to even look at uh, going back in the archives. Oh, you don't want to miss it. Yeah, there's going to be some stuff that uh, maybe is left on the cutting room floor that you'll only find there. There's no tears. Yeah, just, you know, whatever you feel, right? Whatever you feel. It, all of it is uh, out of love and it helps the wheels on this bus keep on rolling. I also ask you to go to my website, www.kenvaldez.com. Over there you can find out more about my music and what I'm doing, concert dates. I'm back on the road. I'm writing and recording. There's so much going on right now. And you can find me there. Plus, there's links to all of my socials there. Be in touch with me because I love hearing from you. Well, that about does it, everybody. Until the next time, thank you so much for listening. Be good to each other. Take care of one another. Bye-bye. Every time I look